what is assembly theory? And generally speaking, how would we recognize life if we saw it? So assembly theory is a theory goes back a few years now. My struggle for maybe almost 10 years when I was going to origin of life conferences and artificial life conferences where I thought that everybody was dancing around a, the problem of what life is and what it does. But I'll tell you about what assembly theory is because I think it's easier. So assembly theory literally says if you take an object, any given object, and you are able to break the object into parts very gently, so just maybe let's say take a piece of very intricate Chinese porcelain and you tap it just with a hammer, with a nail at some point, and it will fragment into many parts. And if that object is able to fragment into many, and you count those num those parts, the different parts, so they're unsymmetrical, um, assembly of theory says the, lo the larger the number of parts, unsymmetrical parts that object has, the more likely it is that object has been created by an evolutionary or information process, especially if that object is not one-off. You've got a, an, a, an abundance of them. And that's really important. The abundance, and I, and I, so because if you, what I'm literally saying about the abundance, if you have a one-off object and you break it into parts and it has lots of, lots of parts, you'd say, well, that's, that could be incredibly intricate and complex, but it could be just random. And I was troubled with this for years because I saw in reality that assembly theory works. But when I talked to very good computational, um, complexity computationalists, algorithmic complexity people, they said, you haven't really done this properly. You haven't thought about it. It's like, this, this is the random problem. Mm -hmm. And so um, I kept working this up because I invented an assembly theory in chemistry, first of all, with molecules. And so the thought experiment was, how complex does a molecule need to be when I find it that it couldn't possibly have risen by chance probabilistically? And if I found this molecule, able to detect it in enough quantities in, the, say, an object, like a machine, like a mass spectrometer. So typically in a mass spectrometer, you, you weigh the molecules in the electric field. You probably have to have on the order of 10,000 identical molecules to get a signal. Mm -hmm. So 10,000 identical molecules that are complex. What is the chance of them occurring by chance? Mm -hmm. Well, we can do the math. Let's take a molecule like strychnine or, um, or yeah, so strychnine is a good molecule actually to take, or Viagra is a good molecule. I made jokes about Viagra because it's a complex molecule. And one of my friends said, yeah, if we find Vi Viagra on Mars in detectable quantities, we know something is up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it's a complex molecule. So what you do is you take this molecule in the mass spectrometer and you hit it with some electrons or in an electric field and it breaks apart. And if the larger than the larger the number of different parts, you know when it starts to get to a threshold. My idea was that that molecule could not be created by chance, probabilistically. So that was where assembly th theory was born in an experiment, in a mass spec experiment. And I was thinking about this because NASA is sending the mass spectrometers to Mars, to Titan. It's going to send them to Europa. There's going to be a nuclear-powered mass spectrometer going to Titan. This, I mean, this, this is the coolest experiment ever. They're not only sending a drone that's going to fly around Titan. It's going to be powered by a, you know, a, a nuclear slug, a nuclear battery, and it's going to have a mass spectrometer on it. Is this already launched? No, it's, going, it's, it's Dragonfly, and it's going to be launched in a few years. I think it got pushed a year because of the pandemic. So I think you, you, three or Dragonfly. four years. Dragonfly. Nuclear dragonfly is going to fly to Titan uh, and collect uh, data about the composition mm -hmm. of uh, the various chemicals on Titan. Yeah, I'm trying to convince NASA. I don't know if I'll be able to convince the dragonfly team um, that they should apply this approach, but they will get data. And depending on how good their mass spectrometer is. But I had this thought experiment anyway. And I did this thought experiment. And for me, it seemed to work. I, I turned the thought experiment into an algorithm in assembly theory. And I basically, assembly theory, if I take, let's just make it generic and let's just take the word abracadabra. Mm -hmm. So can I, um, if you find the word, so if you have a book with lots of words in it and you find abracadabra one off and it's a rap book that's been written by, in a random way, you know, set of monkeys in a room and you know, yeah, had typewriters. And you're on typewriters and you find one off abracadabra, no big deal. But if you find lots of reoccurrences of abracadabra, well, that means something weird is going on. But let's think about the assembly number of abracadabra. So uh, abracadabra has a, you know, uh, has a, a number of letters in it. You can break it down. So you just cut the letters up. 
But when you actually reassemble abracadabra, the minimum number of ways of organizing those letters, so you'd have an A, a B, you know, uh, and keep going up. Um, there's just the you can when you cut abracadabra up into parts, you can put it together again in seven steps. So what does that mean? That means if you basically don't re, you're allowed to reuse things you make in the chain at the beginning. That's the memory of the universe, the process that makes abracadabra. Um, and because of that causal chain, you can then get to abracadabra quicker than the number of letters mm -hmm. for having to specify only in seven. So if you take that to a molecule and you cut the molecule up into parts and you can on the causal chain and you basically start with the atoms and then bonds and then you randomly add on those parts to make the A, make the B, mm -hmm. make the and, and keep going all the way up. Um, I found that literally assembly theory allows me to say how compressed a molecule is. So when there's some information in there. Um, and I realized the assembly theory is, wasn't, isn't just confined to molecular space. It can apply to anything. But let me finish the molecular argument. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I, I had this theory. I, with one of, my, one of my students, we wrote an algorithm. We basically took the 20 million molecules from the database and we just calculated their assembly number. The, uh, and that's the index. Like basically, if I take a molecule and I cut it up into bonds, what is the minimum number of steps I need to take to reform that molecule mm -hmm. from atoms? So reusability of previously formed things is somehow a fundamental exactly. part. Exactly. So it's like a memory in the universe, right? I'm making lots of leaps here. Like it's kind of weird. I'm saying, right, there's a process that can form the A and the B and the C, let's say. And then that when there's and because we've formed A and B before, we can use A and B again with no extra cost except mm -hmm. one unit. So that's the kind of what the chain of events. And that's how you think about memory here when you say the universe, when you talk about the universe and or life is the universe creating memory. Exactly. So we, 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 we went through chemical space and we looked at the assembly numbers and we were able to classify it. We said, okay, let's test it. Let's go. So we're able to take a whole bunch of molecules and assign an assembly index to them, okay? And it's just a, those, it's a function of the number of bonds in the molecule and how much symmetry. So literally assembly theory is a measure of how little symmetry a molecule has. Mm -hmm. So the more asymmetry, the more information, the more weird it is, like a Jackson Pollock of some description. So I then went and did a load of experiments. And I basically took those molecules, I cut them up in the mass spec and measured the number of peaks without any knowledge of the molecule. Mm -hmm. And we found the assembly number, the, the, there was a almost a, not a quite a one-to-one -one correlation, but almost, because not all bonds are equal, they have different energies. I then did this using two other spectroscopic techniques, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, which uses radio frequency to, to basically jangle the molecules and get a signature out. Mm -hmm. And I also used infrared. And infrared and NMR almost gave us a one-to-one -one correlation. So what am I saying? I'm saying by taking a molecule and do it and and doing either infrared or nmr or mass spec i can work out how many parts there are in that molecule and then put it on a scale and what we did in the next part of the work is um we took molecules randomly from the environment from outer space from all around earth from the 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 from the sea from antarctica and from fossils and so on. And even NASA, and, and they, because they didn't believe us, blinded some samples. And that we found that all these samples that came from biology produced molecules that had a, a very high assembly number above a threshold of about 15. Mm -hmm. So basically, all the other stuff that came from that abiotic origin was low. There was no complexity there. Mm -hmm. So we suddenly realized that on Earth, at least, there is a cutoff that natural phenomena cannot produce molecules that need more than 15 steps to make them. So I realized that this is a way to make a scale of life, a scale of technology as well. And it, literally you could just go sniffing for molecules off Earth, on Titan, on Mars. And when you find a molecule in the mass spectrometer that gives you more than 15 parts, you'll know pretty much for sure that it had to be produced by evolution. And this allowed me to come up with a general definition of life based on assembly theory to say that if I find an object that has a, that has a large number of parts, say an iPhone or Boeing 747 or, you know, any complex object and I can find it in abundance and cut it up, um, I can tell you whether that has been produced by an informational process or not. And that's what assembly theory kind of does. 
But it goes a bit further. Um, I then realized that this isn't just about life, it's about causation. So actually, it tells you about where there's a causal structure. So now I can look at objects in the universe, say that again, this cup, and say, right, I'm gonna look at how many independent parts it has. So that's the assembly number. I'll then look at the abundance, how many cups, there are two on this table, maybe there's a few more you got stashed away. Mm -hmm. So assembly is a, is a function of the complexity of the object, times the number of copy numbers of that object or a function of the copy number normalized. So I realized there's a new quantity in the universe. You have energy, entropy, and assembly. So assembly, the way we should think about that is uh, how much uh, reusability there is. Because yes. what reusability is like the, like can you play devil's advocate to this? So like, could this just be a, a nice, uh, tertiary signal for living organisms like uh, some kind of distant signal that's yeah this is a nice property but it's not capturing something fundamental or do you think reusability is something fundamental to, to life in complex organisms i think reusability is fundamental in the universe not just for life and complex organisms it's about causation so i think assembly tells you if you find objects, because you can do this with traje trajectories as well, you think about it, that in the the fact there are objects in the universe on Earth is, my is weird. You think about it. We should just have a combinatorial explosion of stuff. Yeah. The fact that not everything exists is, is really weird. Now yeah. then... And then there, <laughs> as, as I'm looking at two mugs and two water bottles, and uh, the things that exist are kind of uh, are similar and, and multiply <laughs> yeah. in copies of each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. So I would say that assembly allows you to do something that statistical mechanics and people looking at entropy have got stuck with yeah. for a while. So I'm making, it's pretty bold. I mean, I'm writing a paper with Sarah Walker on this at the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're realizing, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves because I think that there's lots of ways where this is, you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting idea. It works for molecules. And it appears to work for any objects produced by causation. Because you can take a motor car, you can look at the assembly of the motor car, look at a book, look at the assembly of the book. Assembly theory tells you there's a way of compressing and reusing. And so when people, I talk to information theorists, they say, oh, this is just logical depth. I say it is like logical depth, but it's experimentally measurable. They say, oh, it's a bit like Komogolorov complexity. I say, but it's computable. And now, okay, it's not infinitely computable, gets MP hard very quickly, right? It's a very hard problem when you could get, but it's computable enough, you could tractable enough to be able to tell the difference between a molecule that's been formed by the random background and by uh, causation. And, and I think that that's really interesting because until now, there's no way of measuring complexity objectively. Complexity has required algorithmic comparisons and programs and human beings to enlabel things. Assembly is label free. Well, mm -hmm. not entirely. We can talk about what that means in a minute. Okay, um, my, my brain has been uh, broken a couple times I'm, I'm here. I'm sorry I explained but it really it, badly. No, it was very well <laughs> explained. It was just fascinating and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, my brain is broken into pieces and I'm trying to assemble it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so NP hard. So when you have a molecule, you're trying to figure out, okay, if we were to reuse parts of this molecule, which parts can we reuse to uh, as an optimization problem and be hard to figure out the minimum amount of reused components mm -hmm. that will create this molecule. And it becomes difficult when you start to look at a huge, huge molecules, arbitrarily large. Yeah. Because I'm also like mapping this, can I, can I think about this? in complexity generally, like looking at a cellular automata system and saying like, what's the, what the, can this be used as a measure of complexity for like a arbitrarily complicated system? Yeah, I, I think it can. It can. And I, I think that the question is, and what's the benefit? Because there's plenty of, um, I mean, in computer science and mathematics and in physics, people have been really seriously studying complexity for a long time. And I think there's a really interesting problems of where we course grain and we lose information. And all assembly theory does really, assembly theory just explains weak emergence. Mm -hmm. and, and so what assembly theory says, look, 
going from the atoms, inter atoms that interact, those first replicators that build one another. Um, assembly at the, at the minimal level just tells you evidence that there's been replication mm -hmm. and selection. And I think the more selected something is, the higher the assembly. Mm -hmm. And so we, we're able to start to know how to look for selection in the universe. If you go to the moon, there's nothing a very high assembly on the moon except the human artifacts we've left there. Mm -hmm. So again, let's go back to the sandbox. In assembly theory says, if all the sand grains could stick together, that's the infinite combinatorial explosion in the universe. That should be the default. Mm -hmm. well, we don't have that. Now let's assemble sand grains together and let's um, and do them in every possible way. So we have a, a series of minimal operations that can move the sand together. But all that doesn't exist either. Now, because we have specific memory where we say, well, we're going to put three sand grains in a line or four and make a cross or a triangle <laughs> or something unsymmetrical. And once we've made the triangle and the unsymmetrical thing, we remember that we can use it again because on that causal mm -hmm. chain. So what assembly theory allows you to do is go to the actual object that you exist, you find in space. And actually the way you get there is by disassembling it. So it's disassembly theory works by disassembling objects you have and understanding the, mm -hmm. the steps to create them. And it works for map, for, bond, for molecules beautifully because you just break bonds. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it's going to be hard, it's very difficult. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult problem to figure out how to break them apart. For molecules, it's easy. If you just keep low enough in molecular weight space, it's good enough. So it's a complete theory. When we start to think about objects, we can start to assign, we can start to think about things at different levels, different atom. What do you assign as your atom? So in a molecule, the atom, this is really confusing because the word atom, I mean smallest breakable part. So in a molecule, the atom is the bond because <laughs> you break bonds, not atoms, right? Right. Right? Right, right? So in a car, the atom might be, I don't know, a small amount of iron or the smallest you know, reusable part, a rivet, uh, a, a piece of plastic or something. So you've got to be really careful. In a microprocessor, the atoms might be transistors. Mm -hmm. And so... As the, how assemb the, the amount of assembly that something has is a function. You have to look at the, the atom level. What are you, where are your parts? What are you counting? That's one of the things you get to choose. What is, uh, at what scale is the atom? What is the minimal exact thing? I mean, there's a huge amount of trade-offs in when you approach a system and try to analyze. Like if you approach Earth, you're an alien civilization, try to study Earth. What is the atom for trying to measure the complexity of, of life? Is it, uh, are humans the atoms? I would say to start with, you just use molecules. I can say for sure, if there are molecules of sufficient complexity on Earth, then I know that life has made them. And then go further and show technology. There are molecules that exist on Earth that are not possible even by biology. Mm. You needed technology and you needed microprocessors to get there. So that's really cool. And that there's a correlation between that uh, between the, the the coolness of that and uh, assembly number, whatever yeah. the measure, what's the, what, what would you call the measure? Assembly index. Yeah, assembly so, I, index. The, the, yeah, so there are three kind of fundamental kind of labels we have. So there's the quantity of assembly mm -hmm. and the assembly, the, the, so if you have a box, let's just have a box of molecules. So I'm gonna have my box. We count the number of identical molecules and then we chop each molecule up in a its individual molecule class and calculate the assembly number. So basically, the, the, you then ha have a function that sums over all the molecules for each assembly, and then you divide through. So you make it uh, divide through by the number of, of, of molecules. So that's molecules. the assembly index for the box? So that will tell you the amount of assembly in the box. So basically, the assembly equation we come up with is like basically the sum um, of e to the power of the assembly index for molecule i times the number of copies of the molecule i. Mm -hmm. And then you normalize. So you sum them all up and then normalize. So some boxes are going to be more assembled than others. Yeah, that's what they tell me. So if you were <laughs> to look at me as a box, so say I'm a box, uh, am I assembling my parts? In terms of like, uh, how do you know what, what's my assembly index? So I, and let, be gentle. So let's just, we'll talk about the molecules in you. So let's just take a pile of sand the same weight as you. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and, and I would um, take you and just cut up all the molecules. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and look at the number of copies and assembly number. So in sand, let's say there's probably going to be nothing more than an assembly number of two or three, um, but there might be trillions and trillions of sand grains. Mm -hmm. In your body, there might be the assembly number is going to be higher, but there might not be as quite as many copies because the, the the molecular weight is higher. 
So, so I, you do want to average it out. You can aver you do so average you, it. I'm not, I'm not defined by the most impressive model. No, no, isn't? you're an average in your volume. Well, I mean, we're just working this out. But what's really cool is that you're going to have a really high assembly. The sand will have a very low assembly. Your causal power is much higher. You get to make decisions. You're alive. You're aspiring. Mm -hmm. Assembly says something about causal power in the universe. And that's not supposed to exist. Because yeah. physicists don't accept that, that causation exists at the bottom. 